Morning, Delaware. Um, I want to thank you all, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of um, some very important conversations about the elimination of racial disparities and the opportunity <clears throat> to survive to the first year of life. So what happens to a dream that is deferred? Langston Hughes's poem poses that question to us. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? It's, it's that or does it explode piece that <clears throat> I can tell you some of us of African ancestry um, feel because there's some things that are a core part of our country that are demeaning to people of color. And we feel that at some point in time, America has to stand up and address those issues. And that's part of what I want to talk about this morning. And I want to talk about it within the context of infant mortality. <clears throat> So here are my objectives for the talk. They're pretty um, aggressive. I don't know that we'll get through everything. But part of what I want you to understand is that this talk is, while it uses as its foundation infant mortality, it really is a conversation about the black-white disparity and the opportunity to survive the first year of life. I don't have any significant disclosures and I don't have any conflict of interest. To keep us on the same page, of course, infant mortality is the death of any live born baby before his or her first birthday. But it's also the stuff on the right side of this slide that both of our previous speakers have reminded us of, that it's one of the most sensitive indicators we have for quality of life. <clears throat> it also tells us something about where we live. So these numbers tell us something about Delaware. That it, it, it's a community mirror. In January of 2013, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality said to us that the contributors to infant mortality are multifactorial. That this, as you just heard Dr. Frame talk about, is not just about high quality health care, but it's also about social determinants. And here, the Secretary's Advisory Committee lists four. And then there's this haunting paragraph at the end of this slide. That is such our ability to prevent infant deaths and to address long-standing disparities in infant mortality rates between population groups is a barometer or a measure, if you will, of our society's commitment to the health and well-being of women, children, and families. I'm going to remind us of this paragraph again within the context of <clears throat> your own data later in this presentation. Sorry. So as we go through Delaware infant mortality data, this is the context in which I uh, will be reviewing that information. This looks at your overall infant mortality rate in five-year aggregate starting in 1979 and ending in 2017. During that period of time, your infant mortal overall infant mortality rate has improved by 46%, and you should be very proud of that. That takes a lot of work, and it's extremely important stuff. When we look at Delaware compared to the United States, so the United States is the dotted line here, we can see that, for the most part, your infant mortality rate is higher than the rate for the nation. What caught my eye, though, was this period of time from 1987 to 1997, so a decade in which the infant mortality rate in the state of Delaware improved at a faster pace than the infant mortality rate for the nation, so much so that you actually eliminate it the state to nation disparity in the opportunity to survive the first year of life. And I think this is very important for you all to understand and recognize because 
This says that if you did it before, then you can do it again, that it's within your DNA to achieve this kind of results. When we look at your data by black, white race, so the black infant mortality rate, the line on the top, the white infant mortality rate, the red line on the bottom, <clears throat> we can see that there is a persistent disparity. And so I remind you of that paragraph by Sackham. The persistence of this disparity says something about you. That black babies in this state die at more than two times the rate of white babies says something about this state. And what is also surprising is the, is the persistence of this 2.4 disparity ratio. From 79 to your most recent data, by five-year aggregates, you've made no improvement in this regard. It's like you're drawing two parallel lines, one for white people and a different rate for black babies. And you have to ask yourself at some point, what, what, what's that about? Now, if we put Delaware within the context of the national conversation, what persists as part of the national conversation is that black babies die more commonly than white babies because group level flaws amongst people who are black. Sometimes we don't say that, we imply it. But if that's what we believe, then if the problem is because of black folks, why should we spend a lot of resources and expend a lot of effort to help improve a black infant mortality rate because the problem is amongst black people in the first place? Whether or not those words come out of your mouth, your actions in terms of the persistence of this disparity suggest pretty strongly that that's the way that you feel. <clears throat> The next characteristic of your infant mortality data that I'd like to look at is this thing that I've made up that's called a survival interval gap. I did it because usually when we talk about the racial disparities in infant mortality, we talk about the disparity ratio. In your case, the black babies die 2.4 times the rate of white babies. And we move on. That's all we have to say about the difference in the rate. If you look at, <clears throat> by five-year aggregate, your most recent black infant mortality rate of 12, and then we go back in time to find out when your white infant mortality rate was as high as your current black infant mortality rate, we have to go all the way back to 1975. We create then this 40 I say approximately 40 years, but it's about 42 year gap. And what I want you to understand from this is that unless you change this pattern, what the state of Delaware tells people who look like me is that black babies have to wait until the year 2057 to experience the same opportunity of surviving the first year of life as white babies in Delaware did in 2017. Think about that. So part of your goal needs to be not only to decrease the disparity, it should be to eliminate the disparity. And I, I've given <clears throat> hour long lectures just on this slide, but the two most important principles that I think you need to understand are the following. That to eliminate the disparity, what we're talking about is getting to a point that we decrease the black infant mortality rate at a faster pace than we decrease the white infant mortality rate. And then point number two, very important. That we need to accomplish number one without any compromise in the rate at which we improve the white infant mortality rate. If we digress for a second and look at those two runners, if our goal is for the runner who is behind to catch up to the runner who is in front, and we establish as one of our rules that we don't want the runner who is in front to slow down to allow the runner who is behind to catch up, then it means the runner who is behind has to run faster 
in order to eliminate that gap. Apply that, if you will, to the racial disparity in birth outcomes. Now, given this versions of this lecture all across the country, and inevitably one of the things that comes up is that people feel it's unfair, it's immoral, it's unjust to think about improving the opportunity to survive the first year of life for one group at a faster pace than we're looking to improve it for another group. I, 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 I actually agree. But where this disparity is concerned, nationwide, because the white infant mortality rate has been improving at a faster pace than the black infant mortality rate, we've been doing just that for centuries and nobody's ever complained. And in the case of Delaware, where the disparity ratio has been the same for the last 38 years, to not adopt this strategy allows the persistence of this unacceptable disparity. So you ask, can it be done? Well. This slide looks at black-white infant mortality and the disparity ratio from 1950 to 2000. The white infant mortality is represented by the purple bars, the black infant mortality by the black bars, the blue line, the disparity ratio. And you can see on this slide that in essence, because the white infant mortality rate improves at a faster pace than the black infant mortality rate, the disparity ratio between the two goes up with one exception, the decade of the 60s to the 70s, where the disparity ratio decreased, where the black infant mortality rate improved at a faster pace than the white infant mortality rate. And that, in my opinion, occurred because of passage of the Civil Rights Act. And I point that out because within the context of all the conversation that you've heard this morning that, that talks about the importance of social determinants of health, understand that that decrease in the disparity ratio didn't occur because we invented penicillin or some significant medical intervention. It was because of a social intervention that resulted in an improvement in the opportunity to survive the first year of life. So we have that decade as a reminder to us that yes, it can occur. And then if we add on here, the decade includes 2010, Remember that, and we'll talk about this a little later in the talk, that with Healthy People 2010, one of the things that we decided is that we wanted to eliminate the disparity in, in health outcomes in six healthcare areas, one of which was infant mortality. And just by that change in the conversation and the approach that we took nationally, the disparity ratio, again, for a decade, significantly improved. So it's not a question of whether or not it can be done. We've proven that it can be done. There's also this article from 2013 from the Center for Disease Control that talked about the declines in infant mortality during that period of time. And I'll highlight for you the information in the second bullet point that during that period of time, the black infant mortality rate improved by 16%, the white infant mortality rate by 12%. It can happen. We've done it. Delaware needs to make up its mind to do it as well. So the other characteristic of your data that I want you to look at is how Delaware is done relative to achieving healthy people goals for infant mortality. So we'll start, oh, I'm sorry that didn't, that yellow highlighted portion should have dropped all the way down, but we'll get through the slides anyway. We said that for Healthy People 1990, our goal was that by the time we got to 1990, we wanted to have an overall infant mortality rate of nine, depicted on this slide by point A, a black infant mortality rate of 12, depicted on this slide by point B. What you can't see as well, because the, bar, the highlighted area didn't drop all the way down, is that for Delaware, you achieve that overall infant mortality rate for white babies by this five-year aggregate data in 1990. Your white infant mortality rate was 8.9. So you achieve that overall infant mortality goal for white babies by the goal date. For Healthy People 2000, our goal was that by the time we got to the year 2000, we wanted to have an overall infant mortality rate of seven a black infant mortality rate of 11. 
In Delaware, you achieved that overall infant mortality rate for white babies about a decade before the gold date. For Healthy People 2010, as I've mentioned earlier, we decided rather than to have disparate goals as a state based on race, that we would just have one goal. And we were very aggressive in establishing that goal. We said that by the time we got to 2010, we wanted to have a one goal for everybody, no matter what your race was, an infant mortality rate of 4.5. <clears throat> Delaware did not accomplish that goal for either white or black babies, but you can see that you got much closer for white babies than you did for black babies. We now operate under the aspirations of Healthy People 2020, which says that we want to eliminate health care disparities, and where infant mortality is concerned, we backed off a little bit and said that by the time we end next year, 2020, that we want all groups to have an infant mortality rate no greater than six. Where white babies are concerned, <clears throat> Delaware accomplished our Healthy People 2020 goal back in the five-year aggregate time of 2004 to 2008, about 15 years before the goal date, depicted on this slide by point Y. And by five-year aggregates, as I mentioned earlier, your black infant mortality rate ending in 2017 was 12, which means that almost three decades after our healthy people 1990 goal that you finally achieved a black infant mortality rate goal by achieving an inf black infant mortality rate of 12. Remember that this data says something about you as a state. So based on this 38 years of data, <clears throat> we've established some patterns. That there's a per persistent disparity gap that there's this significant survival gap, that the state of Delaware has achieved three out of the four healthy people goals for white babies, that the only goal that we've achieved for black babies occurred almost three decades after the goal date, even when two of those four goals were significantly higher than the overall infant mortality rate goal. So I have these numbers at the bottom of this slide to remind me to pose a question to you all. So if I ask you to tell me the next number after two, four, six, eight, you would tell me five, 10, 15, 20, you would tell me. And you can reliably, without any doubt in your mind, predict what that next number is going to be based on the pattern established by that previous set of numbers. Apply that to infant mortality and what you accomplish for white babies compared to black babies. 38 years worth of data, that's a pretty reliable data set. And that pattern, I think, justifies posing this question. Do black babies in the state of Delaware matter as much as white babies? And while everybody generally will suggest, yes, I think that your results don't support that response. Now, I have to tell you that I'm, <clears throat> I'm giving this talk believing that the racial disparity in birth outcomes is the largest, is the most significant maternal child health problem that we face in this country. But again, generally we say, well, black babies die at two to three times the rate of white babies and we, and we move on. We have to change that narrative. Because despite the data, there are some people who believe that the black infant mortality rate can improve. There are others who believe that it can improve, but that it is as high and as bad as it is because of group level flaws amongst black people. And almost nobody believes that it can be the same as it is for white babies. 
Yeah, we have examples like Healthy Start, almost 30 years of history now that takes community after community with infant mortality rates that have to be at least one and a half times the national average. And when we look at their cumulative infant mortality rate for the 100 plus communities that they're engaged in back in, in 2015, their infant mortality rate was less than the national average. Now, we've been behaving where Healthy Start is concerned like it's a local demonstration project. And we usually conduct local demonstration projects to prove to us that something can be done. And after proving to ourselves that something can be done, we then try to spread that project. We try to spread the things that we learn to other communities that need our assistance and help. Where Healthy Start is concerned, almost 30 years of data, we still, as a nation, limit the communities that we subject to what we've learned in this almost 30 years to about 100 communities. But it says to us, it can be done. And so one has to wonder why we're not doing it. So part of the question then is why the disparity? Why, are we, why have we tolerated black babies dying at such a significantly higher rate than white babies for such a long period of time? We've talked a little bit this morning about social determinants. This is a reminder that where infant mortality is concerned, that internationally we recognize that this infant mortality rate tells us about a society's ability not only to provide high quality health care, but food, housing, income, education, and employment. <clears throat> Oh, these slides didn't come out. I'm sorry about that. We'll skip over those. The World Health Organization has reminded us that inequalities in health and avoidable health um, inequalities arise because of circumstances in which people grow, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness, and that these conditions <clears throat> are shaped by political, social, and economic forces. Many of our policy prescriptions that look to deal with uh, improving outcomes in infant mortality um, are projects and programs that help people during the time of pregnancy. So we figuratively take a pregnant woman by the hand and we try to walk her around through some of the obstacles that represent risk to those pregnancies. And those programs are important. They help. But then after the pregnancy ends, <clears throat> we let that woman's hand go. This is a slide of an actual family in Los Angeles uh, who needed assistance and help from various agencies. These are the things that the agencies did. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this lecture. What I want you to see is the map of engagement of those agencies where the family was involved. And then once an episode for which the family needed assistance was resolved, we returned the family to the same conditions that required the assistance and help of the agencies in the first place. And what a social determinant approach says to us is that we need to work hard to eliminate the obstacles. We need to eliminate those things for which our families need assistance and help so that they don't need us for those things anymore. I'm often asked, well, which social determinants should we address? <clears throat> Eventually, you've got to address them all because as the dominoes of the left lower segment of this slide remind us, they're connected so that if you live in a high crime, high poverty community, you don't graduate from high school, it influences the kind of job you get, whether or not you have private insurance, the neighborhood you subsequently live in, you all know the connection between those social determinants. You start in the area where your community <clears throat> can establish the most momentum, the most agreement, but that you have to work on a system that allows you to onboard interventions that eliminate the disparities uh, where the determinants are concerned. <clears throat> Michael Marmoth, who's 
one of the co-authors of the World Health Organization's position on social determinants, one of the godfathers in this regard, says, our profession seeks not only to understand but also to improve things, and some doctors and people in public health feel queasy about the prospect of social action to improve health, feeling that it smacks of social engineering. Yet a clinician faced with a suffering patient has an obligation to make things better. If she sees 100 patients, the obligation extends to all of them. And if she society is making people sick, we have a duty to do what we can to improve the public's health and to reduce health inequalities in social groups where these are avoidable and hence inequitable or unfair. And he believes that this is a moral obligation, that it's a matter of social justice. You've had Kay Johnson here before. I'm proud to share with this group that myself, along with Arden Handler and Ed Ellinger, were three of the people who were significant in convincing the COIN effort to adopt social determinants as one of their uh, intervention strategies. This was the team that was put together that some of the folks here from Delaware worked with if you adopted a social determinants of health approach. They've come up with a template that you can access to assist in that regard. In the state of Ohio, our Health Policy Institute of Ohio also did a study in um, 2017 that looked at how to implement a social determinants approach toward improving infant mortality. Um, the social determinants they looked at were housing, transportation, education and employment. Of course, we know that place matters. Dr. Anthony Eiden and his team in California, the ones that came up with this notion that your zip code influences your health more than your genetic code. And throughout the country, this one being in the Washington DC area, you can see the differences in life expectancy based on location of residency, even when those locations are just um, within miles of each other. The same situation for Philadelphia, where you look at the difference in life expectancy based on where people live. And this example <clears throat> is in Chicago, where you see the same sort of circumstances. And repeatedly, what we find over and over is that those locations where life expectancy is the lowest are places and communities that have been the most marginalized. Um, <clears throat> by our society. In California, when Dr. Iden worked on this, he decided he wanted to advertise this result <clears throat> as much as he could all across the community. So this <clears throat> particular one looked at the difference in life expectancy by area code. This looked at the difference in high school graduation rate by zip code. Any and everywhere he could put up posters, he wanted to make sure that the community was aware of it because if we're not aware, then we're not motivated to change things. Part of the point I wanna to make to you here then is that <clears throat> we have structural determinants, policies, practice, systems that we put in place and those things determine the social determinants. All of our social determinants have consequences. To make it more simple, causes create conditions that have consequences. Our medical model looks like this. Dr. Frame talked about this some, where most of our investment is in the clinical realm. So, we concentrate on clinically what it takes to improve the preterm birth rate, on clinically what it takes to improve the rate at which babies are born with congenital anomalies. We pay very little attention in this country to the social stuff. Dr. Frain shared a slide with you that showed where cost is concerned relative to other countries, that one of the big differences is that we put so much more emphasis in our financial investment into the clinical and not as much into the social. I'm of the opinion that the social is at least as important as the clinical stuff, that we make our best decisions in the area of overlap 
between the two. And if I was going to figuratively draw up how our intervention strategies ought to look, they would look more like this. Because we live in our neighborhoods, work in our neighborhoods, age in our neighborhoods. That's where the emphasis in our intervention strategies needs to take place. This was enforced by <clears throat> this modification of this uh, equity pyramid that was developed by Thomas Friedman at the CDC, where you notice <clears throat> the thick arrow on the left that talks about the interventions that are most high in their impact are on the bottom. Those with the least amount of population impact are on the top. And the foundation of this pyramid has to do with the social and environmental determinants of health. Clinical interventions are <clears throat> almost at the top. Where these determinants are, are concerned, oh, this slide didn't turn out at all. We'll just skip over it, never mind. But what it was to point out to you is that all of these things, all of these domains that influence our health are, if you will, nested in community or society, or so that we have the opportunity to control them. This reminds us of the same thing. It's the quote on the bottom right that I want you to remember here, that when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows. You don't try to put scotch tape on the flower to help it look right. So our basic idea here then is that socioeconomic position, race and ethnicity, gender, all structure the likelihood of multiple exposures at multiple points in time over the entire life course. And it's this lifelong cascade of interacting multiple exposures balanced against resources that are the important determinants of how social inequalities leave their imprint as health inequities. And in my opinion, Poverty and race are intertwined with each making the other worse. Racism represents a particularly damaging and pervasive exposure. And for the poor, I think it's the venom and the bite of poverty. It's intricately woven into every domain of American life and has cumulative detrimental effects throughout an individual's lifetime across all domains and across generations. So, Let's talk a little bit about this whole equity piece. Of course, this has become a pretty popular slide that talks physiologically about the impact of stress on our bodies. I want you to think about this within the context of pregnancy. We are pretty comfortable today telling pregnancy, pregnant women that if you're experiencing a significant amount of stress, <clears throat> that that stress can not only impact your own health, but it can impact the health of your baby. That in ways that we don't totally understand, but at this point we try to explain by the whole epigenetic process that Dr. Frame was talking to you about, that that stress, if you will, gets under your skin and gets incorporated into your physiology so that it can adversely affect the outcome of the pregnancy. But that However, those effects those of stress are transmitted or incorporated into your body, <clears throat> that it also goes to the baby. We not only believe that it can adversely affect the baby, but please understand this piece as well. That we think that the physiologic change that occur in that fetus can be passed on to subsequent generations. And that's what we believe today. I want you to think about that within the context of African American history. The black folks endured 246 years of slavery, 99 years of terrorism under Jim Crow. Think about the toxic stress that black people in this country were exposed to. It's only been 55 years since passage of the Civil Rights Act, and I think most of us of African ancestry in this room would probably suggest to you that things haven't been fair even since the passage of that act. 
The other piece that I think is important in understanding that history is that slavery and Jim Crow alone, to this day, account for 86% of the African American experience. 86%. Yet whenever we compare blacks and whites, in any category, we never talk about that. We never talk about the significant advantage that we've provided to white people while simultaneously exposing black people to significant disadvantage. And it's wrong to leave that out of the conversation because in my opinion, that imbalance of advantage and disadvantage accounts for the disparities that we see today across the board in any area that you look at. So let's take a brief history, a walk through history for what transpired during that period of time. I mentioned 246 years of slavery, at least 12 generations of black people essentially being owned by white people. Remember, this was chattel slavery where black people were concerned. We didn't have chattel slavery when we were enslaving Indians. We didn't have chattel slavery when we brought over Europeans to work under other Europeans. Chattel slavery meant that you were your slave owner's property, your children were the slave owner's property, they were born into slavery, they could expect to die in slavery. There was nothing that was gonna change that outcome. And by the end of the Civil War, the United States was the largest slaveholding country <clears throat> in the entire United States. We fought this war then, in large part to free the slaves. To this day, it represents um, the most lives lost in any war that, war that America has ever been engaged in. Estimates are that between 620 to 750,000 soldiers lost their lives. That doesn't include civilian deaths. The North won the war, freed the slaves. Now, <clears throat> for a lot of us in that, this room, that okay, that was a point in history and we move on. I can't tell you how many times I've asked myself, what if the South had won? What would that mean for me? Where would I be? Would you invite me to a podium like this at a conference like this to talk about this subject? We passed the Civil War amendments, freeing the slaves, making those slaves citizens, and giving men the right to vote. As a consequence of having the right to vote, Slaves went from, according to Eric Fromm, from sheriffs to, from slaves to sheriffs and senators. Over 2,000 black men, locally, statewide, and nationally, were elected or appointed office holders at different levels. This is a picture of some of those people who were part of, were senators or part of the House of Representatives. During that same period of time was the rise in the Ku Klux Klan and the White League, the introduction of this whole white supremacist um, way of thinking, fight, fighting hard to reestablish what we've generally referred to as the Southern way of life. During that period of time, a significant number of black people throughout the entire nation, primarily in the South, were lynched. We passed Jim Crow laws. And look at the duration of time during which those Jim Crow laws were in effect for essentially a century. For our conversation this morning, let's just think about Jim Crow laws being anti-black laws. In 1896, the Supreme Court said, Jim Crow segregation was legal. So it wasn't just in the South. It was all across this country. From 
1865 to 1961, again, almost an entire century, we had what Douglas Blackman refers to as neo-slavery, or slavery by another name, where freed black people were arrested for contrived reasons. They were hit with incredibly high cost for defending themselves and without the ability to pay those costs had to work the cost off. Thousands of black men were imprisoned in this country as a result of this system that never saw their families again. They were never able to work enough to pay off the cost for walking on the wrong side of the street or deciding to apply for a job somewhere else without getting um, your white boss's permission to do so. We all know about the Tuskegee experiment and what took place for that for 40 years in this country. <clears throat> we watched the effects of syphilis um, that went untreated in black men. The pictures on the lower <clears throat> portion of this slide to the left, the first phase of syphilis, which was the appearance of a shanker, lasts for a while and then goes away. And the second stage of syphilis comes back at this horrendous rash that again lasts for a while and then goes away. And then the third stage, attacking joints and other areas of your body that physiologically cause or physically cause deformities and eventually death. Even after penicillin was recognized as the treatment of choice for syphilis, we denied it to these men and continued to watch the progression of this disease. In the 1930s, 1934, the United States formed what was called the Homeowners Loan Corporation. It was to help primarily help people whose mortgage was underwater as a consequence of um, the Great Depression. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, along with local real estate agencies and businesses, uh, decided to develop this model that looked at the desirability of various locations. The most famous piece of this that we hear about is redlining, which were the most undesirable areas um, for people to live in. And those were the only areas that black people, for the most part in this country, were allowed to purchase homes. Richard Rothstein, in his book, <clears throat> says to us that today's residential segregation is not the unintended consequence of individual choices and of otherwise well-meaning law or regulation, but of unhidden public policy that explicitly segregated every metropolitan area in the United States. This policy was so systemic and forceful that its effects endure into the present time. So the most undesirable areas were outlined in red. The second most undesirable areas were outlined in yellow. <clears throat> According to this study by Samson and Wilson in 1975, 70% of African Americans at that time still resided in red or yellow lined, outlined areas. The point is that a system that was so pervasive um, that our government was entirely and totally complicit with, segreg intentionally segregated our country, and it persists uh, to this day. The GI Bill in 1944, when our veterans were returning from World War II, the GI Bill was intentionally enforced to support Jim Crow so that white veterans, <clears throat> about 16 million returning to this country, were able to access 
to assess uh, access um, help with home, education, starting businesses, um, college, job training, those things that afforded the opportunity to actually build the middle class in this country. And black people were systematically excluded from taking part in this system. Then I mentioned the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Since that period of time, of course, black people in very different ways have knocked on the door of this country asking for, begging for, um, an equal shot at taking advantage of what's available to us. In 1968, as a consequence of the riots that occurred in the early 60s, President Johnson formed what was called the, uh, what we generally call now the Kerner Commission, that looked at what the reasons were for the riots, what we could do so that those riots weren't occurring so much anymore. The Kerner Commission is famous for this statement on this slide that our nation is moving toward two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Every 10 years since the Kerner Commission report, the country has looked at the progress that's been made um, since this original study was done. In 2015, Time Magazine had this cover on its article that es essentially said to us that not only was there not much change, but that things were getting worse. In March of 2018, so <clears throat> a little bit over a year ago, um, the 50-year anniversary of the Kerner Commission report was done. And that report said to us that segregation is worse in our country than it was back in 68 when Kerner conducted its study. John Kerry, in part of the book, writes the following. It's been 50 years since the Kerner Commission offered a wake-up call, long in the making, holding up a mirror to confront the reality of a society deeply divided by both race and economic state, um, status. Half a century later, how many more wake-up calls do we need before we face the tragic reality that in many ways, despite pledges by politicians and remarkable local accomplish accomplishments by innovative, creative leaders, in the aggregate as a country, <clears throat> we've fallen backwards. It's an example of that falling backwards, I hold before you, that what we've done in terms of mass incarceration in this country. Remember this started back with the war on drugs initiated by President Nixon. This was a war that was contrived. It was not real. John Ehrlichman revealed that to us many years later. Nixon felt that his two groups that were his biggest enemies were blacks and anti-war hippies, as he referred to them. So he conducted this, this war on drugs. He made it up. Several years later, President Reagan doubled down on this war, uh, creating lifetime consequences for minor infractions. During that period of time, compared to whites, Latinos were two times uh, at increased risk for arrest and black people four times um, at risk for arrest, even though there's no evidence to suggest that black people and white people, they were using crack at about the same incidence. Michelle Alexander reminds us that this war on drugs has been the engine behind mass incarceration. This slide looks at the difference in incarceration rates from 1970s to this one goes to, through 2000. And then <clears throat> if we look at this cumulatively, looking at both jails and prisons, you can see what it's done in terms of our incarceration rates. And one of the things that I like to point out on this slide is that if you look at what's going on on the left side of the slide and what's happened in the right side of the slide, the population of the United States didn't change. We didn't all of a sudden create a lot of bad people who had to be arrested. This was a 
change in policy, a change in practice, a change in systems that resulted in this disparate outcome. One cartoonist summarized the drug laws like this. It resulted in incarceration rates that look like this. So today we accept that one out of every three black men in this country is gonna be in jail, in prison, or dealing with the probationary system. And we act as if that's okay, if it's all right. It's resulted in an incarceration rate for our country that looks like this compared to other countries. 5% of the population, yet in our country we have 25% of the world's prisoners. And now, of course, we're in the midst of this opioid epidemic where the majority of the people who are using opioids are white. And we've decided that we're gonna medicalize our approach to this instead of criminalizing it the way that we did when we contrived an epidemic and made black and brown people its victims. Now I'm bringing this up because I'm trying to make it clear to you this imbalance in terms of how we've managed race in this country. <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But things like Hurricane Katrina, the disparity in infant mortality, this mass incarceration rate all remind us that not all of us benefit from that declaration equally. My point here is that throughout this history, throughout the 400 years since the first slave arrived on the shores of America, we've had this imbalance of advantage to one group, disadvantage to another. For the sake of time, I've got to skip through a few of these slides. So here's the bottom line point. These disparities are not natural. They don't occur within biology. These disparities occur because we made them this way. And the only good news in that is that understanding that we created them means that it's within our power to fix them, to get them to go away. Our national conversation, though, <clears throat> talks about our North Star being health equity. Now, generally speaking, there's not much wrong with that until you understand that social inequality kills, that it deprives individuals and communities of a healthy start in life, increases their burden of disability and disease, and brings early death, poverty, and discrimination, and adequate medical care, and violation of human rights all act as powerful social determinants of who lives and who dies, at what age, and at what degree of suffering. And so, in my opinion, our North Star needs to be equity. And in my opinion, we don't have a snowball's chance in hell of achieving health equity until we first <clears throat> achieve equity. If you're black like me, then one of the so some of the sobering realities that you have to live with is that even though the North won the Civil War, as a nation, we behave as if the South has won the peace. That, as I mentioned earlier, we went from being the largest slaveholding country in the entire world at the end of the Civil War, fast forward 100 years, and we've incarcerated enough of the descendants of those slaves that we now have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And if you are a black person in the United States of America, the bottom line for us is that we are dependent on the same government that enslaves us, that oppresses us, to now save us. And after 400 years, I think this country has pretty clearly shown to us that that's not its inclination, that that's, we are not its priority or who it cares about. I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip through a lot of these last slides very quickly. 
To get on the other side of this, we have to eliminate excuses. Relationship, particularly with communities of color, is extremely important. We have to stop this stuff of going into black communities and fixing them for black communities. So no more for us without us. <clears throat> I don't have time to develop this proportionate universalism piece, but I think it's extremely important. You all know about life course. That's going to take all of us. And this slide is my way of saying that every one of us has a role to play in this. Advocacy is extremely important. Good science, pristine evidence by itself is not enough. We have to fight for these changes. Now, a lot of us work for places that limit what we can say and do in terms of advocacy. So I suggest to you that you have to follow your own moral compass here, but without it, we're not going to get to the places that we need to get. I was going to go through an example in Kalamazoo of how we almost eliminated the racial disparity in infant mortality. What changed here again was policies, practices. It wasn't that the population changed or that the care provided to those patients was any different. Um, I'm not going to go through this because of time. I do want to point out to you, though, that we are now in 2019. This year is the 400-year anniversary of African slavery in America. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, folks, it's time for us to turn the page on how we've mismanaged race in our country. Of course, we're improving infant mortality is concerned. There's all this other stuff that I haven't addressed. I want to leave you with this, <clears throat> that Alicia Garza, back in 2013, sickened by the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's killer, wrote, I continue to be surprised at how little Black Lives Matter. A friend of hers took the last three words from that statement, turned them into the, a slogan. That slogan became a movement. This morning, I want to take the last four words of that statement and remind you that little black lives matter too. Nelson Mandela taught us that it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you. <clears throat>